Good morning, church. Let's see into our feet. Let's describe the God that we are singing to this morning, the God who's working and moving among us. Let's worship him. Come on. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. Come on, this is what he did. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. But my God, he holds the victory. Perfect 
loved us come amen. amen amen well this is our go sunday you guys remember go sunday it's our annual time that we take a peek and look at our various go ministries happening here at crossroads and really all over the globe that we support and um what we're going to do today is um take a look at something really special we have the opportunity to sing um, with one of our missionaries this morning. And this is the Palmutils all the way from India, 8,000 miles away, who are singing the same song, singing to the same God that we sing to this morning, our omnipresent, our global God. And what an amazing thing that the Lord's doing over there. Um, we get to sing with some of the kids that they're ministering to um, called the Living Word Kids. And uh, we reached out to them um, a month ago and just said, hey, would you guys join us? Um, all the way from India in singing a song, and they said, yes, let's, uh, let's partner and sing and proclaim God's blessings, the goodness that we find in him. So we're gonna sing, amen, we're gonna sing 10,000 reasons, all the reasons that we find in our Lord and in our relationship with him. So in a moment, uh, Julie and Tim are gonna introduce themselves, and then we're gonna sing with them. Let's take a look. Good morning, Crossroads family. We are so excited to be with you this morning, all the way from India. I am Julie, this is Timothy, and these are all of our Living Word kids. We are so excited to be able to join you in worshiping our great God. Please join with us as we sing 10,000 Reasons. All right, you guys know it, we'll sing it out. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawn. Here we go. The sun. We 
bless the Lord.
Amen. Amen. So good to worship with you all. Have a seat. Absolutely incredible, isn't it? How'd you enjoy the Palmenteels? What a beautiful family. What an excited family. If you have contact with them, send them an email. Let them know you love them. Let them know that you're praying for them. We are so honored to have them as our missionaries, but what a thrill to get to see their kids and sing with all of those voices. Hey, as you came in this morning, did you see the tent in the parking lot? Okay. You notice the way we set it up, that if you were coming into the parking lot, you, you, you found yourself in line. And so you, you had to just kind of go through the process. Look, we have so much going on today. Let me take a minute and explain just a couple things to you. You may have received a passport on your way in. If you would pull this out real quick. This is a little annual document we're going to produce that gives you an overview of some of the things going on on the outreach front of our church. Not everything could fit in this, so there might be a few ministries where you say, hey, this is happening and we want it in there. We'll get there. We're just layering it each year as we go. But if you open it up, You'll see there a reminder of our mission statement, why Crossroads exists, along with contact info for myself, the whole Go team. If there's something you want to do, an idea you have, you know how to get a hold of us right there. Then a reminder of the Great Commission of the four gospel passages in each of the gospels where Christ tells us to go. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then you'll notice this massive QR code. Here's the way this works. So many people will stop me and say, I want to go on a missions team. And my first comment to you is, do you have your passport? And the first answer is, no. We're going to fix that right now. So what you'll do is when you step out into the tent right here, off to the left-hand side, you'll see a photo booth. That is for your photo for your passport. It looks like this. Now listen, please do this. If you don't have a passport, if yours is about to expire, Let's get that. It's the first step to being able to leave America and go somewhere else on a gospel missions trip that we want to help you do. I looked at it. That's a $15 expense that you're going to pay when you go to the UPS store, FedEx, CVS, wherever else you're going to do it. Get it done for just free for just a couple minutes of your time right out here after the service. You'll want to have that. Then if you scan that QR code, that takes you to the website where everything else can be done online. That's the only piece you can't do online. So get that done today. As you go through this, then it gives you a reminder of the gospel and what we need to say when we explain to someone the hope that we have in Christ. And then 
there's a couple of lines here where it asks you just to simply write down your mission field. Who are the specific unbelievers that God has put in your life, in your path, that you have responsibility to tell about Jesus? And we want to be able to not only have them there, but then pray for them. There's points here about how to pray for our missionaries, for the mission efforts that we are undertaking, an overview of all the different things that we have on the here, near, and there uh, levels of our ministry. And then you'll see at the back, there's a little bit of an overview of our global outreach teams, our GO teams that are going to be coming up in, in the whole year of 2022. In effort to help you understand those teams, mark down November 21st. That's two weeks from today. During both morning services, we're going to hold duplicate mission team interest meetings. If you have any interest in going on a missions team in the next year, please come to either one of those so I can go over all the details of what we're doing, where we're going, what it's going to take to get there, the expense involved, the particulars of the teams, both domestic and international. So please mark that down and just stop by that meeting in the, off, the opposite service that you typically attend. As you go deeper into the passport, you'll notice some blank pages where it gives you a space to write down any outreach ideas you have. Crossroads is such a creative church, and there's always evangelism ideas coming out of the congregation, the family here. So write those down. Let me know. Let me know how I can help you make that happen, and we'll get it done. So you've got that going on. You've got the passport picture, and then you may have seen a table where you can get your exclusive Crossroads work gloves. You need these because you are sent to serve. And as we go out to serve Santa Clarita and as we go out to serve others, it's good to have a pair of work gloves, not only for your garden or for your glove box. Actually put a pair of gloves in your glove box and you have those on hand to serve. So pick those up on your way out. Last thing I'll mention to you is next Sunday, November, 20, November 14th, we have our evangelism training. And after this morning, if you realize that there are some areas in your life where you need to tighten it up so we can be more effective with the gospel, then sign up for that online. I'd love to spend the morning with you helping you understand how we explain the gospel to others and live an evangelistic life. Well, having said all of that, let me take us to the Lord in prayer as we look to the word. Father, thank you for your love and your kindness. Thank you for the gospel message that we just sung, that you went to the cross in our place and you give us your righteousness. We're gathered here today, some out of weakness, some out of despair, some out of fear, and some out of joy and strength. And we come before you as your children, hungry to learn from your word, that your spirit would work powerfully in us and through us, that we could then exalt you in the way that our hearts desire and that you request of us. So take us to your word and help us to learn today. In your name, amen. Join me in Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. As you turn there, it's no surprise that people love their pets, right? Seems like everywhere I go, somebody has a dog. Somebody has a cat, or once in a while you see a bird perched on someone's shoulder. Now, I'm all about pets. I love my dog, but you cannot tell me it's a good decision to have your poodle sitting on your lap, flapping its face in the breeze while you drive down the road. That's always troubling to me. Even the whole therapy pet concept might be a little much when you have people bringing turtles and kangaroos and ponies and turkeys on airplanes as their comfort companion. One man was so infatuated with bears that after years of studying them, he felt he had developed an understanding with this one group of bears, and so he pitched his tent with the bears. And things were going okay because his curiosity was being satisfied with how they lived, but their curiosity of how he tasted was not satisfied until the day you can figure out how that relationship ended. Living with domestic animals has its challenges, but living with wild animals has its dangers. And God makes all of these animals ultimately for his glory, and in his word, he uses them in many ways to give us illustrations of how to live and teach us lessons. In Proverbs, we learn lessons from ants and dogs and in Isaiah, we learn about mounting up with wings like eagles, and Matthew teaches us lessons about birds and how they live and how we have to have faith and trust. James shows us how a rein and a bit is used in a horse's mouth and draws illustrations to the tongue. But in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus uses four animals to teach us one big lesson in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. It says this, 
Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. This chapter finds Jesus taking his disciples and launching them out into a test drive, if you will, a skill-building exercise to go out and to explain the kingdom of heaven to a massive group of people. If you glance back in the chapter to verse 1, he has his disciples and he gives them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every kind of disease, every kind of sickness. And he lists them off and then he says, verse 5, Do not go to the way of Gentiles and do not enter the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He has a very specific people group he wants them to go. Oh, sure, everyone else can hear the gospel, and he's, he's not saying to needlessly avoid them, but he has a target audience that he wants these disciples to go to, and he says, stay focused on that. Verse 7 gives us the content of their message. He says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Go and preach that message. Preach that Jesus is Lord, that he is king, and that he is the king of heaven, and you've got to turn your life from your life of sin to embrace God, embrace Christ. He says, verse 8, to stay focused. He says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, freely you receive, freely give. But he wants them, verse 9, to travel light. He says, don't acquire gold, don't accumulate for yourself a bag for your journey, don't take extra clothing. He says, just move. This is a high-velocity trip. You've got to stay focused and keep going. And so when we get down to verse 16, he has covered what he wants them to say, and now he wants to address the manner in which they go. And this is so timely for us because the same commission that he gave to his disciples there, he gives to us in all four gospels where he tells us to go out and tell the world about Christ. But the instructions he gives us in how to do this are key for this morning. And so as I read to you, verse 16 says, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be wise as serpents and innocent as, as doves. It's here that we learn four lessons for everyone who's going to proclaim Christ. Four lessons for us as we go out and we walk among wolves. The first is this. We see the dependency of the sheep. The dependency of the sheep. Now you catch that and you think, sheep? Really? Why not? Send us out as tigers or grizzlies or German shepherds or at least something with some fangs and claws, some talons, maybe maybe some horns or something. But sheep? Really? Have you spent much time with sheep? As kids, our, our house burned most of the way down, so we had to move first into the Holiday Inn, which I thought was fantastic. I mean, someone else made my bed every day, and we had a pool. Like, that was just wonderful. And then we moved from there into a, another house with family members, and my aunt and uncle decided that it was best for us kids to have some chores, so they bought some sheep. And so we moved in, and so did the sheep. And those stinky things are a sponge for every piece of mud and bug. They run around, they're smelly, they're slimy, and then they will headbutt you. I mean, you think, what on earth? Sheep? But Jesus calls us sheep. And I think he draws out one key word, and that's the word dependency. Dependency. The great shepherd calls us sheep because we're dependent on him. In fact, he said this in John chapter 15, verse 5. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Sheep are vulnerable. Sheep are susceptible to dangers on all sides. Sheep need direction. They can't chart a course. They can't see down the road. They can't navigate the terrain on their own and think what are the implications of stepping here or stepping there. In fact, that's why David says in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Verse four, he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because you are with me. The good shepherd, the great shepherd is with me us. And we have him over watching us, giving us direction, pointing our path. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says that if we trust in the Lord with all of our heart and not lean on our own understanding, in all our ways acknowledge him. And what happens? He directs our paths, right? He directs our steps. And we need that because as sheep, we can't plan that course. We need him giving direction. We need him giving us protection. 
Sheep don't have claws or fangs or camouflage. In fact, all they have is wool. And you may have heard about this one sheep named Shrek. I think he's up there. You hear about this guy? Escaped his pen and for six years wandered amongst the hills. Sheep grow about 10 pounds of wool a year, so 60 pounds of wool are on this poor little guy. Now, different attacks came his way. You know what he did? Nothing. Because all you got was a mouth of hair. Don't do that. Jesus gives us protection. He protects his sheep because sheep are helpless on their own. He says this in John chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they'll never perish. You hear that? That as sheep, that's not a humiliating title. That's a title of dependency, a title of protection that God looks at us. He says, I give you eternal life. You have nothing to fear in this life or the next. You have nothing to worry about. But not only does he say, I give you eternal life, and that takes us over the bridge past death into heaven. But John 10, 28 says, no one will snatch them out of my hand. No one's going to touch you. No one's going to pull you away from God. Because the great shepherd says, I have you. Not only does he give us as his sheep direction, protection, but he also gives us provision. No sheep cultivate their own food. They don't store up a harvest for winter or for difficult times. They're not pack animals. They can't carry anything. They need provision. And that's why the writer of Hebrews says, Hebrews 4.16, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I can go to the good shepherd. I can go to him. And I can ask him for help and he will hear my prayer because he guides us through this life. This is affirming the reality and the intimacy of our relationship with our creator. It's such a tender relationship where he gives us his grace and his peace and his comfort, his wisdom, his mercy. He doesn't call us cattle where you drive him from behind. He calls us sheep where he leads us from in front and goes before us, not only giving us a path to follow, but a model to follow. You see, he walked before us doing what we cannot do. John chapter 10, verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And we have Christ who leads us, who guides us, who cares for us, but who sacrificed his life for us so that we would be redeemed from what we were as sinners damned to hell to be sons and daughters of Christ destined for eternity with him. But look back at verse 16. Look at how it starts. That's the illustration he gives us as sheep. And you understand a little bit more about that. But you think that if you're going to have sheep that are everything I described them to be, what are you going to do? You're going to protect them. You're going to have a big wall around them. You're going to put some barbed wire on top. You're going to have guards and gates and lights and all kinds of cameras to protect the sheep, right? Let's look at what Jesus does. He says, I send you out. Think, stop for a second. My instinct is to protect the things that I'm responsible for, to give my life to protect those things. And Jesus says, I send you out. He's got a bigger plan than holding back something. In fact, his plan involves all four gospels Matthew 28, 19, and 20, Mark 1, 15, Luke 24, 46 to 48, and John 20, 21. The four gospel proclaiming great commission verses telling us to go out. Jesus' plan is to open the doors and take his sheep from the fold and says, go, get out of here. Go out to that world. He sends us out. He compels us, commissions us, deploys us, fully informed of all the dangers and the damage that could happen, knowing what the risks are, he doesn't say stay. He doesn't say think about it. He doesn't say talk about it. He doesn't say deliberate about it. He says go. It's that simple. All that we do in studying God's word and worshiping him together results in us taking action, stepping towards an unbelieving world. 
I think of Isaiah 6, and just remember this with me, as you remember Isaiah 6, where Isaiah is a vision of heaven, and he sees into heaven. And around God's throne are the angels worshiping him, and they're saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. There it's proclaiming that the whole earth is full of his glory. And Isaiah, seeing that, steps back and immediately recognizes the contrast between God's holiness and his sinfulness. And he says, I am a man of unclean lips. Woe is me. Woe is me. I am not like you. And heaven then reaches out and cleanses Isaiah's tongue. And a voice from heaven says, the voice of the Lord says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Who shall I send and who will go for us? Who will go across the living room? Who will go across the street? Who will go across your office? Who will go across this town? Who will go across this nation, across this globe? Who can I send? Says the Lord. And Isaiah answers, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. My friends, we cannot gather together and pour out our voices in loud, bold worship for Christ in this room and then whisper about him out there when we step amongst this unbelieving world. Worship always leads to witness. Praising Christ always leads to proclaiming Christ. We have no option. How dare we erupt in song in here and then whisper about him out there? We shouldn't spend more time strategizing about our shopping trips than we do strategizing about how we're going to evangelize the loss that God's put right around us. But friends, I'll tell you this. Time is not on our side. Time is not on our side. We live here in Santa Clarita. You know that Santa Clarita is one of the leading towns in suicide attempts in Los Angeles? I mean, the facade of life here is so thin. And we live in a world that is desperately reaching out for hope, compounded by all the drugs and all the other expressions of depravity and evil that, that all of us have to deal with on a daily basis. And all we have to do is let our light shine before men so that they see our good works and glorify our Father who's in heaven. That's all we got to do. Spurgeon said this, the saving of souls, if a man has once gained love for perishing sinners and his blessed master will be an all-absorbing passion to him. It'll so carry him away that he'll almost forget himself in the saving of others. He'll be like the brave fireman who cares not for the scorch or the heat so that he may rescue the poor creature on whom true humanity has set his heart. There's a forgetfulness towards our own safety, our own peril, and a mindfulness of the eternal hell that awaits those who leave this earth without Christ. On our lobby wall right out here, you'll see the pictures of some of our GO partners, our international GO partners, and you'll notice that one of them is a mirror. My friends, that's not a gimmick. That's your future. Some of us are so desperate to get out of California, and I understand that, but you're not going far enough. We need to stop looking for houses out in somewhere else in America and start looking for a home somewhere else in the world. Maybe God's call for you is not to open your next business to fund missions, but to open your next business in the mission field and to take the gospel message to people who desperately need it. I mean, who isn't tired of traffic, taxes, and wants a bigger sense of community, right? I can give you unreached people groups around the world who will give you exactly that. This is such a clear call that God gives to us to forsake the entrapments of this world and to look seriously about the purpose of our life and for some in this room, it's to stop praying about missionaries and start becoming a missionary. To take the gospel to the mission field and to leave this place on purpose for Christ. You understand me? We are weak. We are vulnerable. We are the sheep that Christ calls us. But he sends us out, not to Disneyland, but he sends us out to the darkest corners of this town to the hardest places and the toughest relationships so that we walk in the room with a message of hope, a message of peace, a message of grace and forgiveness. And we look evil in the eye and we call to repentance, knowing that the great shepherd has sent us. God said to Isaiah in Isaiah 6, who shall I send? Who will go for us? 
Will you answer, here am I, send me? Isaiah did and the disciples did because they knew they were being sent out. And not only were they sent out as dependent sheep, but second, in Matthew 10, 16, we learn about the damage of the wolves. The damage of the wolves. If you put it in one word, it's savage. It's more than just a personal identity. It's a word for the entire system. They're designed to destroy. They're serious hunters. They're devastating predators. They're a perfect killing machine. No conscience, no guilt, no fear of death. Just instinct that drives them to attack, sometimes indiscriminately. They stalk, they ambush, they kill, they consume whatever makes them feel good. Just ravenous. And the wolves that he mentions are already here. They're not on the horizon moving towards us. He says, you're stepping out of the fold and you're with the wolves. They're present. You walk among them. Jesus uses this imagery to spotlight the entire world system. But then in the verses that follow, he drills into a little bit more. In fact, look at verse 17. He starts to give us three different categories of where these wolves function. He mentions, verse 17, beware of evil men. Beware of evil men, men that are evil. This is just a word for the depravity of life that's out there. People who hate Christ, and since they can't kill him, they look at your representation of him, and they come after you. With vicious slander, thrusting sin before your eyes, vomiting the rebellion all over you, ambushing you with temptation, consuming your energy with distractions that dissipate your gospel witness. They're antagonistic, they're aggressive, act with malice, towards you it's the painful reality of many who are even here this morning that you are in a context where you'd work with people who actively hate christ and aggressive towards you i'll never forget one gentleman i met who he was just absolutely everything that the world describes in terms of someone who's on drugs alcohol living out of their car can't keep a job nothing and finally he gets a job and he sees his boss and just hates her because everything she does just is saturated with the gospel. And he does everything he can to get her fired. He lies, he frames her, he blames her for things, he slanders her, he undercuts her, manipulates everything trying to get her fired because he can't stand that gospel message. And she just kept laughing saying, you gotta repent. And just loving him and caring for him and pointing him towards Christ until the day he did. And then he married her. <laughs> you would talk about a marriage. That's epic. <laughs> Evil men. They're out there. And look what God does. He sends us right out to them. To take the gospel to them. Not only that, but go deeper into verse 17. He says that these people will then deliver you over to the courts and to the scourge you in their synagogues. You'll be even brought before governors and kings for my sake as testimonies to them and to the Gentiles. He says, not only is it evil people in general, but then it's also a government system that will legalize and codify depravity. That's designed that uh, the more it grows and the more it goes, it's going to take all the perversity of the world, set that as a standard, and then hold you to try to match that standard and come after you, prosecuting you, fining you, impeding you. And not only do you have a government system that is corrupted by evil. But then look at this even more intimate section of verse 21. He says, a brother will deliver up to brother to death and a child, a father is child and children will rise up against parents and will cause them to be put to death. This is what takes place, even in your own family. And some of you are living this right now. You've got a spouse that cannot figure out why on earth you'd come here on Sunday morning. You've got kids or parents, you've got coworkers, you've got people close to you who make light of, mock, and intimidate you, trying to disrupt what you're doing right now. And you crawl in here and you gather with your spiritual family that we're going to heaven with. And you draw joy and encouragement from the worship and, and strength from the word. And we step back out into the world again. You say, why is all this onslaught of attack coming towards us? Well, it's right there in the middle of verse 18 and again in verse 21. He says, for my sake, for my sake. Look at verse 22. You'll be hated by all on account of my name. You'll be hated on account of my name for my sake. It's because you represent Christ. It's 
because Christ is living in you and through you and the world can't stand that. It has a constant allergic reaction to that. 2 Timothy 3, 12 says, All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Why? It's for Christ. You say, how do we respond to this? If here we are as sheep and you have wolves that are attacking the sheep, how do we respond to that? Well, Christ told us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, he said this, Blessed are those who persecute you for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. He said, you can expect it. And when the accusations come, when the slander comes, when the the hard times come, be reminded that you're blessed because you walk with Christ. You serve him. And he'll supply the joy and the strength and the daily grace to endure. Matthew 5, 44 says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Their opposition means we're on the right track. And our response is selfless, supernatural love that in humility is on our knees, putting their name before the throne room of God and saying, God, save them. Save them. You may be thinking, I'm afraid. And that fear is real. That fear grips us. There is so much pain and agony and heartache and betrayal and loneliness that goes on when we try to separate people from their cherished sin. But Jesus tells us this. Look down in the chapter. Look at verse 28. Listen to his encouragement that he gives us. He says, don't fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So don't look at them with fear. The worst that can happen is they do something to your body, but they can't touch your soul. They can't touch the real you. They can't touch the part that lives for eternity. He says, fear the one, respect the one, worship the one, honor the one who does have that authority. Even verse 29 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a cent, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But the very hairs of your head are numbered. Therefore, do not fear. You are more valuable than the sparrows. He says, oh, your worth is so much greater than a couple of birds, and I know everything about you, even the number of hairs on your head. This is how intimate he is connected to us. He wants our eyes to be set on him and to be aware and know and be resting in his love and his protection of us that takes away any fear we have of this world. In fact, you may not understand this, but the word safety is never prayed for in the New Testament. You won't find anyone saying, pray for safety. In fact, the only time Paul uses the word, he does so in 2 Timothy 4, verse 18. He says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. It's the only time Paul really talks about safety. Every time the the scriptures talks about the word risk, it's always in the context of someone giving their life for the sake of proclaiming Christ. There's something far more important than our own personal safety, and that is our obedience to Christ. Because the most dangerous place a Christian could be is living in disobedience to God. That's far more dangerous than putting ourselves at risk with this world that ultimately can't change our eternal status. So how do we do this? How do we, as sheep, go out and walk amongst savage, vicious wolves? Well, number three, learn from the wisdom of the serpent. The wisdom of the serpent. Again, another animal. So we've looked at sheep, we've looked at wolves, and now we're looking at snakes which not many people like. There's a lot of people that cringe at even the thought of them. You call someone a snake that always has negative connotations, and when you look at the Bible, snakes don't seem to have a good reputation. In fact, in the first couple chapters, we meet one, right? And he's talking, and he's Satan. And you drill deeper into the Bible, and you keep finding snakes always showing up where there's trouble. And so here we have this statement about wisdom of a snake, and you think, what on earth? What is this? Well, wisdom is the exhortation, and the snake, the serpent, is the illustration. 
He says, be wise. Saturate your mind with God's wisdom. Have God's word flooding through your thoughts. Memorize it. Meditate on it. Learn from it. Tell it to one another. Have this in your mind so that you'll be an effective evangelist with the right words to say at the right time. Have your, the word of God so stored in our hearts, as Psalm 119 verse 11 says, that we will not sin against God. Job 23, 12, I've not departed from the command of his lips. I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I've had God's word in front of me and I cling to it so tightly that I won't let it go. I need it more than I need even the sustenance to support my life. He says, you take that wisdom and then how does it function? Well, that's where the snake comes in. You say, what is it about a snake that's worth imitating? Well, there's a shrewdness. There's a calculated action plan. There's a cunning aspect to them. There's a cautiousness. It has the idea of saying the right thing in the right way at the right time. Not needlessly being inflammatory, but directed by grace, thoughtful. There's wisdom in looking down the road to see what's going to happen and sensing that, being aware of it and positioning yourself in the right place to do the right thing. Colossians 4, 5, and 6 says it this way. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders. That's you, walking amongst wolves. How do we do that? We walk in wisdom towards them, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. That means you study the word, you have it saturated in your minds. As you interact with the unbelieving world, God brings to mind the words to say to get from whatever you're talking about to the gospel to call them to repentance that you'll have the presence of mind by God's wisdom in us to be able to speak with wisdom toward anyone. Jesus so clearly demonstrated this with the woman at the well where he spoke to her in a calm, kind voice that directly addressed her sin and called her repentance with such a respect and a mercy. This was Jesus speaking to the woman who was caught in adultery and, and drugged before him by a crowd that was looking for her death and wanting Jesus to incriminate her and Jesus addressed her sin, but then looked at the crowd and said, let him with, who is without sin cast the first stone. And in a wise, kind way, he protected her from all of them, separated them, giving her dignity and calling her to repentance, giving her forgiveness, new life, and sending her on her way. This is Jesus when the Pharisees sought to stump him over and over again, and they bring to him this, this quandary of, do we give money to God or Caesar? And he says, give to Caesar what's Caesar's and give to God what God's. There's wisdom in all of that. And that same wisdom is available to us as we study the word. And what he's telling us here is the snake shows us how wisdom moves. And sometimes that means avoiding trouble, moving out of the way. I was driving down the street the other day. I'm in the outside lane on a main road. And I see a car parked in the lane right up, way up down the road. You ever have that experience? So what do you do? You lay on the horn, you tuck your head, you speed up, and you just get ready for impact. You go plow right through that thing, right? What does wisdom do? Change lanes, right? Move on past. Some Christians live life like the first illustration. And they see trouble, and they lay on the horn, they tuck their head, they speed up, and they get ready for impact and just leave a trail of carnage for no good reason. It does nothing for the kingdom. It does nothing for the mission field. All it does is destroy the opportunity to proclaim Christ. What he's saying is, be wise. It's Psalm 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. He says a snake knows how to manage the distance and therefore manage the damage. To avoid trouble. But also... This illustration helps us to learn to be alert to attacks, being able to pay attention and know what's going on around us, sense the danger. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. We know that Satan's out there stalking, and being wise means you become aware of his attacks, the, the avenues through which he'll come after you, knowing your weaknesses, knowing your vulnerabilities, be sober at all times. This wisdom helps us to adapt to circumstances. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 22, I made, all, 
I am made all things to all men that I might by some means save some. He says, I, I, I can let go of freedoms. I can let go of things that are important to me so that I might be able to be in position to proclaim Christ to somebody. Makes you quick to adapt to circumstances, but also makes you aggressive with the gospel. Where Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 that we just studied a couple weeks ago, that he delivered as a first importance what he also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried, he was raised on the third day. This wisdom makes us aggressive with the gospel because we know that time is short. We know there are strategic opportunities. We know that God puts us in position for a moment that we'd open our mouth and proclaim Christ to someone who desperately needs to hear it even if they don't want to accept it in the moment. He says, you have the wisdom that you see in a serpent. And then last, there's the innocence of the dove. Guess what? Another animal. This time it's a bird. We've seen the sheep, the wolves, the snakes. Now we're lifting off with a bird. And of course, birds always have a stigma with them. You see seagull and you think irritating, right? Eagles, you think majestic. Vultures, you think nasty. And chickens, you think Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Doves. What comes to your mind when you think of a dove? Weddings, pure. There's a innocence about them. In Scripture, we see them used in a, a, quite a few ways from the Old Testament sacrificial system where they're a part of that. At Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove. All through Scripture, you see them used with an illustration of purity, of innocence, something about them that sets them apart. And that's the point. Innocence is the expectation. Dove is the illustration. He wants us to live an uncompromising life, a life that's not rude, abrasive, one that's not inconsiderate, but one that is characterized by holiness. Proverbs 22, verse 1 says, A good name is more desired than great wealth. Internally, there's integrity, that there's no gap, no secret sin that we're hiding. There's no gap between who we are in public and who we are in private that undermines the gospel. Externally, there's a meekness about us. There's a willingness to be vulnerable, to take the hurt and step back into the arena and love anyways. Christ's name is at stake. The purity of our message is critical. That's why James chapter 1, verse 27, he says, Pure and undefiled religion is to care for the orphan and widow in their distress and to keep your life unstained by the world. That there's no scar or mark on our life that the world sees and uses that to disparage Christ. Peter says it this way, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 and 12 says, Brethren, or beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. That it is a battle that all of us face. And he says, abstain from it. Don't feed it. Run from it. Verse 12 of 1 Peter 2, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, not if, but when they speak against you, they may see your good, de good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. When that happens, you'll point them to Christ. 1 Peter 3, 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it's better for you to suffer for doing what is good than it should be, and it, if that should be God's will, than for doing what is evil. You catch this. It takes both wisdom and innocence to walk among the wolves. We need wisdom so that we don't hurt others. We need innocence. Let me state that differently. We need wisdom so others don't hurt us. We need innocence so we don't hurt others, as one author said. Innocence without wisdom is too weak to be safe. Wisdom without innocence is too subtle to be good. It takes both of these together to walk among the wolves as Christ intended us to. Ultimately, it was Christ who did this. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 says that we have been called for this purpose since Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example for us to follow in his steps. He committed no sin, nor is any deceit found in his mouth. That's the wisdom and the innocence together. 
And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. That's what he does. And that's what he did. And that's the example we have to follow. So what about us? Frankly, Crossroads, this is our local outreach strategy. This is how we intend to to reach Santa Clarita. And the way we do that is by every single one of us waking up every single day and walking out into the world as salt and light, as sheep amongst wolves, and living with wisdom and innocence. To boldly open our mouth and tell others about Christ. And it's so encouraging as I move through the city and to see our family members out here doing exactly that. It's such a joy to, to watch and to see how you share Christ with one another. We get to hear that in the baptism testimonies, don't we? As over and over again, people say, this person led me to Christ. This person confronted me. This person helped me find hope. I saw this so vividly over the last couple of weeks as I had the privilege of being over at Heart High a couple of times for Bible studies and teaching there. My friends, the courage of our students to every single day walk among wolves and to go to those campuses and not just represent Christ, but open their mouth and proclaim Christ. To tell other students about their need for repentance and to call them to salvation. Oh, I wish you could all go. You'd be so encouraged to see how across this valley, probably the most effective evangelists in our church are between the ages of 12 and 18. Because they're out there every single day doing this. They need our prayer. They need our encouragement, don't they? But they walk into this world just like all the rest of us in the work world. And you deal with this world in a way that calls them to repentance. We've only just begun and there's so much of the Great Commission left to do. I think of the example of Daniel as he's lowered into the lion's den and he sees the lions. And he might, from heaven, chuckle at us saying, yeah, I had, you, you get wolves, I had lions. Like, oh, he had it really bad. But what did God do with the lion's mouths? He shut them. You know, some of the greatest stories and the greatest miracles we get to witness is when God shuts the lion's mouths and when God saves wolves and turns them into sheep. My friends, that's all of us. The people we're talking about out there are what all of us used to be. And God gives us the opportunity to take his gospel message and to proclaim it in a way that exalts him and calls him to repentance while there's still time. That's the commission we have, and that's what we get to do. Well, let me pray for us as we would then go. Father, thank you for your mercy and your love. Lord, we lift our our hearts before you. We, We come before you wanting to see you exalted in the salvation of people around us. Lord, I pray for the mission field that's represented right here. For the people we're talking to about you from spouses, parents, kids, co-workers, neighbors. Lord, whoever they are, you put them right around us. Lord, I pray today would be the day of salvation in their lives. Transform them that we may see your power on display. Thank you, Lord, for the boldness of those in this room. I pray that you encourage the faltering hearts, that you would strengthen us, that we would be able to see your transforming power work even today in someone's life. So, Lord, take us from this place to go out into the unbelieving world to proclaim you and honor you till the day we see you face to face. In your name, amen. Well, my friends, it is Go Sunday. And as you leave, you'll see the tent. And what I'm asking you to do is to help us. Children's Hunger Funds, who we're partnering with out there, we're packing over 2,000 boxes today. We're sending the whole container to the Philippines to put those food packs in the hands of people who desperately need it. Take a few minutes, stop by, grab your work gloves, and then remember, November 21st is our meeting for for the GO teams if you're interested. Our prayer councils will be up here. We look forward to serving you any way we can. We love you, and Crossroads, let's go.